know me too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, professor of law and history at uh, Harvard and the faculty director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. Welcome to our program exploring education as a uh, path to social mobility. Now, our symposium today connects past efforts to achieve racial justice led by Charles Hamilton Houston with present efforts to achieve social justice uh, led by our illustrious speakers for today. Houston, one of Harvard Law, Law School's most uh, distinguished graduates, was called the Moses of the struggle for racial equality. He earned this title uh, because he was the intellectual architect of the NAACP's legal strategy to end racial discrimination, a strategy that covered several areas, the labor market, politics, housing, criminal law, and, of course, education. In fact, Houston uh, was the genius behind the strategy uh, that uh, yielded Brown versus Board of Education, um, one of our most important uh, constitutional cases, one that changed the world. Now, for our program today, we focus on education, one of the many areas that Houston touched, based on our conviction that uh, equal educational opportunity remains a foundational civil rights issue. Access to quality education makes all the difference in the life of uh, a child, whether individuals can achieve their full potential as citizens, as political actors, as members of the workforce. And we're pleased to have a keynote speaker and several panelists to help us think through four big issues. First, there's the connection between educational access and social mobility. Two, the factors that limit and the factors that promote achievement among underrepresented students. Three, what successful interventions around education look like for these communities. And finally, the rewards as well as the challenges of involved in these endeavors. And I want to say that we at the Houston Institute are especially uh, happy to have these uh, speakers talk to us today as we prepare to launch our own set of initiatives, education access, um, to prepare disadvantaged students for college. And now, let me introduce our speakers. Our keynote speaker is Deborah Beal, the founder and president of the Posse Foundation, an organization premised on Beal's idea to send uh, students from diverse backgrounds to college in groups called Posse's to help them uh, reach graduation and become leaders in their fields. Beal earned a doctorate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and received the coveted MacArthur Fellowship for her innovative work. Our panelists include Sunita Pantan, a graduate of Harvard Law School and a pastor and executive director of Metro Community Center in Inglewood, New Jersey. In the recent past, uh, Sunita was the Managing Director of Academic Programs at Legal Outreach, a college prep organization based in New York City. Uh, Reverend Pontan will tell us all about the college-bound uh, programming of legal outreach during her remarks. Our second panelist is Professor Jennifer Smith, who holds a doctorate in educational administration from the University of Texas. Professor Smith was instrumental in the development and implementation of UT's Leadership Network, which is a nationally recognized program to increase graduation rates at the university. She will talk about her experiences at UT uh, during her remarks. Next, we'll hear from Raj Sahotra, a member of the Harvard Law School class of 2018, who is uh, the co-founder of Swag to College. Raj is an alum of Teach for America and a former uh, teacher at a local Houston charter school, and he founded this uh, organization, SWAG, while he was teaching. Raj, I should also say, is one of my most impressive former students, uh, and uh, very happy to have him here with us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Our final panelist is Robert Lewis Jr., who is the founder and president of The Base. Lewis is a nationally recognized advocate for urban youth who has held leadership positions in City Year, the Boston Foundation, and Street Safe Boston, among many other organizations. Boston Magazine recently named Lewis, who is an advisor on urban affairs to uh, Governor Charlie Baker, one of the city's most powerful leaders. Mr. Lewis is here to talk about the base, an organization that uses the power of baseball to lift and support black and Latino youth. Then, following a question and answer session, we'll hear closing remarks from Professor Lamont Flowers, who's there uh, in the audience, if you'll raise your hand so people can see you, <laughs> who's a professor of education and a leading researcher on the factors uh, that affect African-American educational attainment. Professor Flowers also is the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Center at Clemson University, which is a co-sponsor sponsor, excuse me, of today's symposium. Now, here is how we'll proceed. First, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, uh, and then from each panelist uh, in the order introduced. And next, we'll open the floor to questions and answers. And without uh, further ado, our keynote speaker, Deborah Beal of the Posse Foundation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to use all the mics that are available. This one. <laughs> OK. Um, thanks for having me. Nice to be here on stage with all of you, really impressive people with great projects. Um, trying to think how to open this. I just wanted to tell you that the title of this was interesting to me. Um, I put it up here, tearing down the wall, dismantling barriers to educational opportunity during the Trump era, which are the operative words, I think, as we open this session. Um, and you're, you know, you're going to hear about Posse. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Posse. And I wanted to say that, you know, when you think about Posse and the incredible efforts and initiatives and programs that the four panelists are involved in, um, I wanted to try to set context for how we work on access and equity issues in this climate in America. In this climate, and specifically for me, I'm going to kind of heavily lean towards a focus on race, but not only. Um, so I hope to set that context, and you kind of have to bear with me with this um, slideshow that I have for you. And all of you should have a blue and yellow card in front of you, and we will use those later. Does everybody have one? I think so. Yeah. Good. OK, so how many of you had heard of Posse before? That's great. That always makes me happy. <laughs> um, but for those of you that haven't, I'm going to make sure we're all on the same page and catch you up a little bit on the program. But you probably heard the story. There's some Posse alum in the room, if you can wave your hands. Oh, great, over there, too. Um, in the 80s, when the word Posse was a little bit more hip than it is today, <laughs> There was a student who had dropped out of college who said, I never would have dropped out if I had my posse with me. This is a picture of a posse. We thought, what a great idea. Why not send a team or a posse of students together to college so they could back each other up? And that way, if you grew up in, I don't know, the Bronx and you ended up in Middlebury, Vermont, you'd be a little less likely to say, forget it. I'm going home. So we tried it, and it worked. And over the past 28 years, we've sent over, uh, well, almost 8,000 kids to college. They've won an astounding $1.1 billion from our partner schools, and they graduate at rates of over 90%. So we have these three goals. And keep this in mind, because you're going to hear about these programs and these initiatives and Posse. We're all trying to equalize the playing field a little bit. So we're trying to expand the pool from which the best colleges recruit kids, right? Everybody wants, you know, the Dominican kid with the highest SAT score. Well, there's a limited number of those students. And so we end up with institutions that are focusing heavily on SAT scores and ACT scores that are, you know, too white and too Asian. They don't represent 
the diversity of the American population. So we're trying to expand the pool. We're trying to help our institutions create a campus climate that's more welcoming to students from all backgrounds. And that involves a lot of programming. And then finally, this is the thing that we want you to remember, if nothing else, because that's what this whole presentation that I'm doing is about. Posse is about making sure we have a pipeline to leadership positions in the workforce. It's not a college success program. It is, but it's not, it's not just that. It's about making sure we find this outstanding kid in Boston or New Orleans or New York who we think can one day be a senator or a CEO. Just bear that in mind. You'll see why. So we grew a lot. It worked. Posse worked. And actually, let me just tell you one story about how well it worked. In that first posse that we sent to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a kid from Brooklyn. She was Dominican. Her dad drove a yellow cab. And she lets me say this. She had 800 combined on her SAT. Combined. Combined. That's a bad score. But she was really smart. We knew her. We got her into Vanderbilt in the first posse. She graduated with honors. She got her doctorate in clinical psychology from Duke University. She became the dean of the college at Middlebury. And last weekend, I attended her inauguration as president of Ithaca College. Isn't that great? I know, it's so great. So we knew with this works, right? So we grew. We're now in 10 cities. And I'll show you. We have 56 partner colleges and universities. These are them. You don't have to read them all right now. I know you really want to. but um, And I'm going to set the context for why we exist. Remember, what's our, our number one goal? It's to create leaders for the workforce, a new kind of national leadership network, one that this country has really never seen. It's not a good old boys network, right? It's not a network from the Greek system. It's a network that represents the demographics of the United States of America. So let's look at where we are. These are the current demographics. I think most people know these, right? This is what our population looks like in this country. And we know that by 2060, it's going to look something like this. Non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority in the United States. But when you look at poverty, in the United States, you can see that blacks and Latinos have a higher percent of their population living in poverty. And look at what it is when you look at the child poverty rate. This should shock you. 38% of black children in this country are living in poverty. And look how that compares to white and Asian. We know that when you get a college degree, your earning potential is much greater. And interestingly enough, the more elite the institution, the greater earning potential you have. Do you want to say something? Oh, OK. You're just going to like that. Um, I think it's also important to look at the inequities that exist even so. When you look at the middle class, you see that Hispanics and blacks are, have a lower median income, which means that their place in the middle class is more vulnerable. OK, so keep all of that in mind. And let's look at the workforce. I thought you would be interested to see what the 15th United States Congress looks like broken down by race. And now I'd like you to see the United States Senate. 90% of US senators are white. 80% are men. These are our representatives. Fortune 500 CEOs, I think many of you know this, right? Of the 500 leaders of the top 500 companies, Five CEOs are black, 10 are Latino, nine are Asian. Only 21 are women, which is under 5%. And some of these overlap. 
So we thought, well, maybe when you look at the Section 16 executives, those are the kind of next level, the C-level suite, you know, the people who are COOs and CFOs and executive vice presidents, 91% are white. Only 17% are women. Diversity at big law firms. Look at who the partners in big law firms are. 92% are white. We found this data point to see how much it changed from the year 2000 to 2010. 2000, 88.8% .8 of attorneys were white, and in 2010, that number had not changed. I know I'm in the law school. I thought I would throw that in there for you. <laughs> <laughs> How about sports? 98% of the majority owners of the NBA teams are white. 97% of the owners of the NFL teams are white. 98% of Major League Baseball teams' owners are white. And look at who the players are. When you look at who runs four-year colleges and universities, these are the presidents. 88% of presidents are white. 22% are women. And this ed education, this is a field dominated by women. So, I'm not trying to depress you. I'm just trying to make a point. We have a problem. And what I want you to look at is what's happening out there. On our college campuses, you see these kinds of words in the press, in the media. This should all seem familiar to you. You probably have an association with each of these words as you see them. And I want you to look at some pictures. And I'm going to be quiet. I just want you to look at these pictures. You'll recognize some of them. Some of them you might not. But this is the context in which we are living. This is the world that America is. These pictures represent what has been happening over the past year or two. And when you think about race and when you think about access and trying to build a society that really strives to be a meritocracy, this is the context in which we live.
So before I wrap up, because I know I only have a couple minutes, I want to ask us all in this room this question to set us up for the questions you're going to ask the panelists and hopefully get a discussion going. What are we supposed to do? What is our responsibility? And I'm just, I know we don't have time to talk now, but I want to see, just do a kind of human survey. Raise your blue card. Everybody take out your cards. Raise your blue card if you personally ever experienced or witnessed an act of bias or prejudice. You might want to look around the room to see how many cards went up. <laughs> Keep your card up. Keep that card up. Raise your yellow card, for those of you that have your card up, if you think that that act, an act that you're thinking of, was resolved satisfactorily. OK. Put your cards down. Raise your blue card if you ever disagreed with the majority or the popular view in any, any situation. <laughs> OK. So keep those blue cards up if you feel you have. And raise your yellow card if you generally kept this disagreement to yourself. OK, it's, see, it's more mixed. Keep looking around. OK, put your cards down. Raise your blue card if you ever heard someone call the millennial generation entitled. <laughs> I I <laughs> oh, we didn't give you cards. Sorry. <laughs> okay, keep those cards up. Keep those cards up. You've heard that. Raise your yellow card if you think that's kind of an unfair title. All right, so look at that. Look at all the yellow cards that went up. But put your yellow card down. Keep your blue card up. So now you are still the people who've heard the, the millennial term used. Put your yellow card up if you kind of thought this to yourself once in a while as well. There is it, some admission in the room. OK. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> this is not a trick question. OK, raise your, yellow, your blue card if you're worried about race relations in the United States. Just wanted to see. Put your blue cards down. Raise your blue card if you're worried that the US has become too polarized. Now, keep those cards up and raise your yellow card if you think we can fix that. It's mixed. Last question is raise your blue card if you ever stood up for something or someone, if you've ever done that in your life. And here's my point. OK, it's almost everyone. Card down. I'm going to leave you with this, and then I'll be done. I think a lot of times we wonder what we can do. And we know we can vote. We know we can vote. And that's huge. And I would say one of the most important things we can do is vote. But we need leaders in this country in a way that we don't see them showing up. And I'm going to tell you this quick story. Last year, I was in a room with 50 Posse alumni, incredible kids who had graduated from these great colleges. And the room was at Deloitte. And the person speaking to them was the CEO of Deloitte, the CEO talking to 50 Posse alum. Her name is Kathy Engelbert. Oh, it's a woman. And one Posse scholar raised her hand and she said, you're a woman. How did you get to be CEO of this Fortune 500 company at Deloitte? And Kathy said, I'm going to tell you. She said, you need to know three things. One, you need to work really hard. I was like, OK, well, that's not that enlightening. 
<laughs> she said, two, you need to find a mentor, someone who can guide you and advise you. I thought that was good. But then she said, three, there needs to be someone who can pound the table for you. She said, let me tell you what I mean by that. I worked hard. I was ambitious. I was motivated. But there was a man who was an executive at Deloitte. And when he was in the boardroom, when he was in the room where the decisions were made and the door was closed, he would pound the table. And he would say, have you thought about Kathy? Kathy's pretty incredible. Kathy's amazing. Have you considered Kathy? Have you thought about Kathy? Kathy, 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 Kathy. And Kathy became CEO of Deloitte. And it gave me chills to hear that because all these people sitting on the panel here, everybody at Posse, everyone in this room, we can pound the table. We can pound the table for one person. Every one of you has stood up for someone or something. Now we need to pound the table for a person we believe can make a difference, even if it's just one person. It's something we can do. And I want to leave you with that thought and say thank you for letting me talk to you because I believe that that is a powerful way to make change in this country that we so need. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. I'm also a preacher, so you got to talk back to me. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and stick on time. I'm going to set my timer, and I'm going to go. My name is Sunita Ponton. Um, I'm the former managing director. Actually, can I have the clicker? Um, I'm the former managing director of academic programs at Legal Outreach. And I, is it? I should have asked. Is it set up? Um, Are we ready to go? I'm not sure. Um, but I'm the former managing director of academic programs at Legal Outreach, and I just left in August, so I'm still very familiar with the program, and our executive director um, sends his regrets that he could not be here. Special thanks to Professor Tamiko Brown-Nagan for allowing me to come in his stead. Uh, yes, that is us. We're good. So um, Legal Outreach is a law-related college prep organization based in New York City. It's also a pipeline diversity program to the legal field. We're not going to talk about that today. Um, the mission of Legal Outreach is to change the educational trajectories of urban youth from New York City. We want to close the achievement gap. We want to give our students options. And, um, and our goal is really to send students to competitive colleges and for them to be college ready. So um, as we, we just spoke of, it's, it's about, and we're unapologetic about this, we want our students to go to competitive colleges because they have access to financial aid, because they have access to an alumni network, they have access to internships and study abroad opportunities and job opportunities once they graduate. But what we're noticing is not just that students get to college, but that they perform well once they get there. So we need to make sure that we are equipping our students um, in the high school years so that once they arrive at college, they're able to compete and they're able to graduate and to graduate on time. So let's talk um, a few statistics. OK, so what's the problem? Um, we're starting out with some local New York City information here, the high school dropout rate for black students is 8.8%. For Hispanic students, it's 11.2%. Let me just add in that we're overlooking the Hispanic population, and we need, really need to spend some time thinking about them. The high school graduation rate for Asian students is 85.6%. For white, it's 82.1%. For black students, it is 68.1%. And for Hispanic students, it's 66.9%. Matriculation rates going to school, um, we see black students 56.3%, Hispanic students 54.8%, and graduation rates, um, Asian students 71.6%, white students 60.7%, black students at 35.8%, and Hispanic students at 49.6%. 
So where does that leave us in New York City with our students? Um, and this is where legal outreach comes into play. Let me give you a little bit of background about our organization. Our organization began about 33, 35 years ago with a graduate from Harvard Law School. His name is James O'Neill, and he is still the executive director. And he started this program because he noticed these types of disparities. But what he also realized is that you can do all this um, talking, but you've got to do some work. And it takes hard work. It takes lots of work, um, work that a lot of people don't want to do. Um, and our students, our current population of students is about 79% black and Latino, and then we have Asian students and white students. Most of our students are coming from one of the most impoverished communities in New York City, parts of Brooklyn, Queens, um, Manhattan, and the Bronx. And they're not at your specialized high schools. They're not at you know, your Stuyvesants and all these uh, very prestigious schools, but we've been able to do some great work. None of our students drop out. 100% of our students graduate high school in four years. 99.3% matriculate at four-year colleges. And that 0.7% are students who go to two-year colleges. Um, within four years, 79% of our students graduate from college. Within five years, 12% and within six years, 2%. That means overall, we have a 93% graduation rate from college. And I'm hoping she makes it in my next three minutes or so. We have a student who's a senior here at Harvard, um, and I told her she's gonna meet me here, and hopefully she makes it in time so you all can wave at her. Um, but our students, you know, again, we want to make sure that they're doing well. This was a survey that was conducted from the class of 2016 with an 83% response rate. Um, the average GPA for our students is 3.3. The average, um, with 82% of them having a 3.0 or higher, 43% having 3.5 or higher. So we want to make sure that they're doing well once they get there. And we can talk about, you know, there's some other stats here that I'm going to, breeze by about how more effective we are than their high schools in preparation, preparing them for college. But what does all this mean? How do we do it? <laughs> it is a four-year program. We call it the pipeline um, to college and, and hopefully into law school. It's a four-year program. We believe in Great. We believe in making an investment in our students and helping them to make an investment in themselves and in their futures. We do that by fostering vision at a very early age so that students can see what's possible for them. Um, this begins with one of our key signature programs. It is our entry program. It's called the Law and Justice Institute. It is a five-week mock trial and criminal justice program. And at the culmination of that uh, five weeks, our students will have um, demonstrated a mock trial before an actual sitting judge. A few years ago, there was a judge, her name was Sonia Sotomayor, who judged our mock trial debates, and how excited were our students to find out that she is now, she, she's now a justice on the Supreme Court. Um, but during the, the Law and Justice Institute, we have attorneys come in every day and talk about the field um, in which they work. We have students visit law firms. They visit corporate counsel offices. They visit judges' chambers. They go anywhere where lawyers work because we want them to see what it looks like to be a lawyer. Um, they have internships. This is another way that we try to instill vision with our, with our young people. Um, they spend three to five weeks rotating. This is important. They're rotating at different law offices and different public, in, uh, public inst institutions because we want them to see where lawyers work. And we don't want them in the mail room. We don't want them answering phones. Our students, and when we, we partner with these firms, we tell them we want you to give them real work. So our students are working on mock summary judgment motions. They're working on contract negotiations. They're meeting with clients. They love to take international phone calls to an attorney who's working in you know, London or Dubai because we want them to get a taste of what it's like to be in a professional environment and to see themselves there to put on a suit, to go into an office and feel like you belong there. 
But when we do all this, then we kind of leverage that experience to get them to do the work. We say to you, do you remember what it felt like to go into that office, to have them call you sir or ma'am, to kind of do all these things? Well, now you have to do the hard work. You know, how do you get there? And even if you don't want to be a lawyer, we want you to have the option to be in a professional field and not be pushed into a profession because you have no choice. So this is part of the, 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 the pipeline here, and it's kind of hard to see here. I didn't realize how bad it was going to look up there, and I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so we start with the Law and Justice Institute, which is a five-week mock child program that serves. There she is, Chanel. <laughs> Sorry, I already told them that I was going to shout you out. Um, so we st- um, and once they come into us, um, we we work with them for four years, and overall they put in about twenty three hundred hours outside of their high school experience. They have a four year writing program that works with grammar, begins with grammar, then persuasive writing argumentation, and then finally culminates with a research paper. There's an after-school study and tutorial center that's available to them um, their entire time where they're, while they're with us. They participate in a constitutional law debate program, and they debate three times a year for three years, and they work on their writing and their critical thinking, their public speaking skills, their presentation and preparation skills. There's a a one-year life skills course where we're trying to help them make good decisions while they're in high school. We provide them with four years of advising. Um, They also participate in college counseling. So they have an individual college counselor who's going to take them on college tours and college fairs and walk them through the college application process. And this is so important because our guidance counselors are overworked and they will make bad choices for our students if someone's not pounding the table for them. Okay, so many of our students have been told not to apply to Harvard, to, 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 to uh, UPenn, to Morehouse, to Skidmore, to, to Brandeis, to some of these wonderful schools because their guidance counselor didn't think they could do it, but we knew that they could do it. Um, they uh, have a- SAT and ACT prep courses. The majority of our students' scores rise by at least 250 points once they finish our SAT prep program. They take a college-level philosophy course because we want them to understand the intensity of, of the college environment, of reading and writing and, and class participation, going to office hours, asking for help, the things that, the, the, the nuances of college that someone doesn't always teach you. And then we, they, they take a study skills course where we talk about that transition between high school and college. Um, we really try hard to make sure that we are doing the hard work. Let me say this, and I'm sure all of our panelists can attest to this. It takes the dedication of staff, It takes the dedication of volunteers. It means setting high standards for our students and not accepting anything less than them meeting those standards because we know they can do it. It's not easy to change the world, but I do believe that we are working very hard to do that one student at a time. And I welcome your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, I am so glad to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, This is incredible. I'm learning so much. I love coming to events like this, and thank you all for being here. Um, My name is Jenny Smith. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin, and I have the privilege of directing the University Leadership Network. I'm going to say ULN from this point forward. Um, We uh, wanted to give you just a quick overview of the program. Back in 2011, the four-year graduation rate at the University of Texas at Austin was 51%. And so um, moving forward, uh, former uh, Vice Provost President, or Vice Provost Lauti um, was tasked with raising the four-year grad rates to 70% by 2017. Um, the Student Success Initiatives um, unit was created. It sits within the provost's office, and that's where the ULN sits. It's one of multiple um, initiatives that have been run out of that unit um, that I have the privilege uh, to run. Um, In short, ULN is an incentive-based scholarship program with a focus on leadership and professional development. Um, I've been in higher ed for 14 years, and any time you're able to create an environment to provide students with holistic 
resources is really exciting, and to have um, the financial support of your institution <coughs> is really exciting um, because oftentimes I know we don't always have that. Um, in a, in just to kind of give you an overview, we do have four years of comprehensive programming. Um, we bring in 500 first-year students from all colleges and majors. Um, if you want to kind of get an idea of our, our demographics, we serve um, about 500 students that are coming in. There are 70% um, or higher of underrepresented students from underrepresented populations and about 75% um, first-generation college students. Um, in uh, coming together, um, we bring them together in freshman orientation, and um, they earn a scholarship of up to $20,000 over four years. Um, they actually earn it monthly, so it's very different in terms of financial aid disbursement when you get that lump sum at the beginning of the semester. Um, it's, it's more in line with uh, workforce environment in that you have program requirements that if you meet those program requirements, your monthly disbursement goes right into your checking account. Um, and so financial literacy, I would have to say, is one of the greatest needs of, of education for students when you think about um, things that are outside the curriculum that they need to understand. Um, our foundational year for our first year students, they actually meet all together. That's why we're capped at 500. Um, at some level is that our largest lecture hall sits 500 <laughs> students. Um, I know you all are familiar with the TED Talk model, so we actually bring the students together every other week for a leadership speaker series where they're trained on, to, on um, topics to help them become leaders in the classroom, the community, and the workplace. On those off weeks, they meet with peer mentors, um, in groups of about 20 to 25. It's challenging to build community in a group of 500. Um, so it's really important um, to help create that sense of community and sense of belonging in those smaller group sessions. Um, we have about 80 to 90 peer mentors who are upperclassmen in the ULN program who serve as those mentors and they participate in uh, weekly training. Um, I think their professional development is incredibly important and utilizing peer mentors in um, student success programs is by far my favorite way, the most beneficial way, I think, to extend your organization's way um, of reaching your goals because ULN has a staff of six uh, full-time, including myself, um, or seven. I'm sorry, we have seven now. We just hired a new person. I'm so excited. Um, we have seven. Um, so our program model is one program coordinator to 500 students. It's a very high caseload. Um, and so when you think of um, how do you go about doing that, data is incredibly important. We use a variety of, of resources, whether we're looking at um, what we call advisor's toolkit, which kind of gives us an idea of academically what's going on with that student, in addition to um, some Tableau visual representations of uh, the data for our students. Um, we're able to tell which students are not quite on progress towards degree to graduate in four years. And so you know you always have students who are doing all the things you've asked them to do and making um, all the uh, necessary steps to move forward. And then you're able to quickly tell, okay, they're just a little bit off, or oh my goodness, we're, we're really off. Let's come in and have a conversation and figure out what might be going on. Um, I often um, compare my or call my coordinators um, case managers because in a way it is their role to be aware of all the relevant resources on campus whether it's financial aid or counseling and mental health the international office their academic advisor all those pieces it's our job to make the connections because when they come in we make sure we're not sending them off without that connection of who can help you um, I want to move on into um, our second year. Our first year is all about training and leadership and professional development. The second year, all of our students engage in on-campus internships that are funded through their scholarship. So if you um, want to make people really happy when you go in to pr propose a new program, tell them that there will be no line item for their budget. <laughs> um, walking in to units across campus and saying, what have you always wanted to do that you don't have time or staff to do? And let me help you do that by providing you with a trained student. Um, we have students from um, working in areas of HR, athletics, human resources, the provost's office, doing first year research um, in different areas, you name it. And we have over 800 interns currently on campus. 
in their third and fourth year, um, we really needed to recognize that our students are the most financially vulnerable students on campus. Um, they still carry eight to $9,000 in, in debt every year. Um, so we've really encouraged them to find paid opportunities in their third and fourth year, and they're um, encouraged to go off campus um, to work in internships. They can study abroad, engage in project management, et cetera. Um, and so we really try to push them to have a variety of opportunities. Um, they can also engage in opportunities in the summer, um, which is really helpful, particularly for our STEM students, um, as they have um, high co coursework hours in the lab, and sometimes they just can't fit in an internship in a particular semester. Um, our first class came in with a likelihood of graduating um, in four years of 33% based on our predictive analytics, um, which goes back to about 10 years of data. I'm really excited to share with you that we had a 55% grad rate this year of our first class of four-year uh, graduation rate. And we have 99 students who are still enrolled, um, upwards of 40 are about to graduate this December. So we're really excited about um, having a part in not only creating an environment for their academic success, because that four-year graduation rate is very important, um, but having a next step. Um, I'm really excited to say also I have a student here who's a freshman in the virology, um, the virology department or the um, studying that area. But we have students in grad school going into industry positions, going into um, you know Peace for America or alternative tracks like that. Um, um, just being able to provide an opportunity for those trajectories to be different, and it does take hard work and really dedicated staff. Um, I can't say enough about, you all know the work that's, that's being done um, and pounding the table absolutely needs to continue, whether it's in your hiring or training your students to move on um, to that next step, um, being able to provide an environment where that holistic care is taken into account. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said I already had two minutes remaining. Is it time? Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Usually, I run out of, of I run out of time. Um. So just kind of think about all the components of the program. Um, for any given year of our curriculum, um, we have our, our monthly programming for our second through fourth year students, whereas it's every other week um, for our first year students. Um, we have them engage in a variety of reflection opportunities. Um, I think it's really important while you're providing all the great experiential learning, you're providing the opportunity for professional development, but in our society, we don't often take time to sit back and say, how have I grown? How have I changed? Where am I going? Where do I want to go? And how can I get there? Um, I would say some of our largest challenges is trying to encourage our students to engage in help-seeking behavior in the very beginning um, and providing them with the model that leadership is about understanding where your limitations are and being able to ask for help when needed and finding the resources to do that. And in that, you're building the network. We didn't choose that, that title lightly, right? We're building a network um, that will help you move to that next step. And as leaders, I always tell them from the very beginning, you lead from where you are. You don't lead because you have a particular title. There's always someone next to you, behind you, in front of you, and they're paying attention. Um, and so it's part of their role as a part of this network um, to move forward. And it's been really exciting to be a part of this. Um, we often talk about creating ULN as um, kind of like flying a 747 and building it at the same time <laughs> when you're creating a program for 500 students each year. Um, so it's been really exciting to see our first class graduate, and I really look forward uh, to your questions because it's a big endeavor, and you always want to say, what can I take from this speaker and, and take to my own institution? How can we do this? So I'm excited to hear questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Raj Solhotra, and I'm a, a third-year law student here. Um, before I start, I want to thank Professor Brown Nagin. Um, she taught me 1L spring semester uh, education law and policy, which is a great course, and she's definitely become a mentor of mine now, and she's supervising a paper I'm writing this semester on community colleges. 
Um, I also want to uh, thank a few of my uh, classmates are in the audience, and it's nice to see them here as well. So I appreciate that. Um, and finally, uh, Ms. Beal, uh, thank you for being here. Um, when I told some of my old students who are Posse scholars that I was going to be here with you, they were thrilled, and they want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done and that Posse continues to do every day. So thank you for that. What I thought I'd do is I'd tell five stories that will illustrate swag to college. Um, so when I was a teacher, uh, I taught pre-calculus and AP statistics in Houston um, at a charter school, and all my students were Latino or African American, and they were all below the poverty line. Right down the street, there was a traditional public school, and the graduation rates were starkly different. Um, at the charter school where I taught, the graduation rates were upwards of 85 to 90%. And at the local public school, the college graduation rate was 9%. And so there was a world of difference. Um, February of 2015, I went to a subway uh, near my school to grab a sandwich. And the cashier behind the counter clearly was a high school student. So I asked him, I said, where are you going to school and where do you want to go? And he said he went to the nearby public school and that he wanted to go to the University of Houston. And I said, that's great. What's the challenge? And he said, money. And I said, we've heard that before from students. And so I said, have you applied for the FAFSA or the Pell Grant, second semester senior, and he said, what are those? And I remember getting in my car, and I called one of my old students, Graciela, who's a Posse scholar now at uh, Colby College, and I told her, and I was like, Graciela, we've gotta do something about this. And she said, oh, I can help him out. I know what the FAFSA is, I know what the Pell Grant is. And it was in that moment that we created the model of pairing college students with high school students. And so now we have 450 high school students, primarily in Houston, paired up with a college mentor. And the college mentor checks in with them weekly through text message, email, phone call, to guide them through a curriculum that we've built. It starts in ninth grade and goes all the way to 12th grade. Three steps every single month to guide students to and um, ultimately through college. We have more than 90% of our students are Latino and or African American, and over 88% receive free or reduced lunch. The second story is, unfortunately, uh, it can't stop there. We know that when students get to college, there's a lot of work to be done. And so I want to uh, discuss two students, um, one of whom uh, is a freshman at Wellesley College. She was a refugee from Iraq in Houston, and she signed up for our program and was going to Wellesley, far away from Houston in the cold, as I think those who are from the South know, being up here is a little different, uh, to say the least. And she didn't know anybody at Wellesley. We were lucky enough to have someone in our network who was a junior at Wellesley, so we connected them in phase two of our program, which is upperclassmen mentorship. So when our students become freshmen in college, we connect them with an upperclassman at their university to guide them through the very difficult freshman year. As many of us know, during freshman year, we see a huge dropout, particularly for low-income and minority students, particularly for those who are going to schools uh, that they may not know others at, or they may not have their posse with them. Um, we currently have 25 students in that program. The reason it's so much fewer is we've only graduated 100 students so far. The program started in 2015. Um, and so we've had 100 students graduate from high school. And I think one of the things that we're proud of that makes us perhaps a little bit unique in this space is um, we've had students matriculate to Houston Community College and Princeton and everything in between. Because we understand that every student needs a mentor and every student can use that support, whether you're going to a community college, a four-year college, or anything in between. However, we also know that getting through freshman year of college is not the be all end all. We've got to get through the rest of college and into the workforce. And so we connect sophomores in college with young professionals in their career field. And here I want to tell you about uh, my friend Audra. Audra was a law student here who just graduated and now she's working in Houston. She is a Latina. So we connected her with a student uh, at Smith College who is also a Latina who would like to go to law school. Daisy is a student at Smith who has no idea how to get to law school on her own. Nobody in her family has been a lawyer. 
Very few people in her community are lawyers. But Audra knows how to do it. She just did it. So why not have Audra checking in with Daisy once a month via phone to guide her through the application process and ultimately through law school and into the workforce? And so we have 60 students who are uh, connected with a young professional in their career field, guiding them through college and into the workforce. And to support all this, we have very frequent check-ins with all of our mentors because what we did the first year was we said, okay, you're paired up with this person, you're paired up with this person, and we hope it goes well. And we didn't really follow up. And needless to say, uh, it didn't go so well. Um, and so now we have very frequent check-ins. So the college students who mentor high school students submit an online Google form once a month, letting us know how things are going with their mentee. We also have clubs at all of the high schools in Houston where we have a a, a partnership. The clubs are run by high school students themselves, and we have an intern visiting those high schools <coughs> every month. At the colleges, we now have clubs. So we have mentors at over 100 universities across the country, and we have clubs at over 20 of those universities where we can build that community at the university. Now, when we get to the upperclassmen students mentoring the college freshmen, Again, monthly check-ins so we can track the progress and step in as needed. Finally, young professionals with the college students, bi-monthly check-ins, and again, we track the progress. I wanna point out a few final things here. Uh, the first one is we've built a system where everybody is both receiving mentorship and paying it forward. So if you're a college freshman, you're mentoring a high school student and receiving a mentor who's an older college student. If you're an older college student, you're mentoring a freshman and receiving a young professional. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is um, early in my teaching career, I learned not to bet against students, to never bet against a student, particularly a first generation or minority or low income student who has all the odds stacked against him or her. And I think too often, we have bet against those students. Um, at Swag to College, I'm proud to say we have no paid staff, zero. Um, we have 1,000 students in the program, high school and college, no paid staff. Instead, we have 15 first-generation college students who are running this program. That's how we have built this. We have built a movement to ensure that this is run by students themselves. You know, I think so often we've seen nonprofits where the folks who run it are not familiar with the communities, have not been in the communities, Hello. don't know what the communities need. We've said, well, why don't we just empower students and then get out of the way and let them do the rest? Students in the room know exactly what I'm talking about here. And the last point I'll say is um, we think we have identified a potentially low-cost model to supplement other programs. We know we're never going to be able to provide full college counseling advising for every student. That's not the point. We know we're not gonna be able to ensure that every student gets a full ride to a university. That's not the point either. What we know is that if we can have a student who has someone who looks like them, who's from a similar background as they are, who checks in with them once a week and says, hey, how are your classes going? Do you need to go to a tutorial this week? Have you registered for the SAT exam? Do you know what Khan Academy is where you can get free SAT prep? Do you have a posse interview coming up like we have several students? Do you wanna do a mock interview? Can we support you by reading a college essay? Do you need help with your resume? Those are the kind of things we can do. And we're excited to work together with a lot of other organizations to continue to build a movement of first generation minority students who are themselves leading and supporting other first generation and minority students. Thank you so much and I'm excited to chat further. Thank you, Rod, you were making me nervous. I thought you were gonna get ready to start pounding the table. <laughs> uh, so a couple of things, it's interesting to sit here because I'm, I'm a disruptor. So if I'm here, real talk, real talk. So I'm not gonna sit up and sell an organization, I'm not. 
I can tell you what we do, but I want to get down to real talk. None of that data and statistics that's up there is new. Is anyone surprised? That's been the same data 40-something years. Over the last 15 years, when you look at the number of black and Latino young men who have actually attended college, we've only increased it by 1%. By 1%. And we've put trillions of dollars into this. The data is up there. The data is real, but it's, it's about what we do. So just to start off, I'm that kid. I am that kid. Mom had six kids by the age of 22. Six. Fourth grade educated, and my father was fifth grade educated. Data tells you all these things. You have to have 15 books in a house to learn how to read. We had four. My mother said, read. And you learn how to read. So what did I do? I'm a project kid. I'm a public kid. I'm a welfare kid. How the heck have we let data define who we are? Because I'm from the projects I'm less than, I only live in an at-risk community. I'm not at risk of anything except being successful. So if you look at the base, we use no negative connotations. You walk in the first sign you see, we are morally obligated that every child is safe, healthy, warm, fed, unabused, and educated. It's a moral standard. Where the heck have we gone that we set goals? We believe, we love, and we provide access. We don't shake hands. You will not get a handshake at the base. We love and we hug. We teach young men to hug. See, the other thing, too, is I decided to do an organization that brings it right to where the folks are. I'm in the hood. I went to the most violent neighborhood in the city and built a state-of-the-art facility right there. Right there. I actually run an associate's degree college on site. SAT, on site. We do everything, public speaking, on site. Oh, when you check it out, black, urban, inner city, those negatives, You'll check out on our website in 2010, we're the first inner city baseball program in America to win the United States Baseball Championship. In 2013, we won the United States Baseball Championship. In 2015, we won the United States Baseball Championship. Don't tell me a zip code holds young black and Latino folks back. See, I've done this for 35 years. I was never a 501c3. I've never understood a 501c3 makes you important. I was a kid from the hood who started a baseball program 35 years ago and raised $250,000 a year. And five years ago, I was at the Boston Foundation, and they submitted the poverty report. Black and Latino boys weren't positive on one social determinant in Massachusetts. Then we're not positive on one social determinant in the United States of America. So then what do we do? The information isn't new. What do we do? So guess what, folks? Hit the ground. Hit the ground. Move your organizations where they need to be. You can't apply to work for the base. You can't apply. We don't do volunteers. I have two of my colleagues here. Alexander, raise your hand. I met Alexander when she was two years old, invested in her. Alexander went on, grew up in public housing, graduated BU 12 years, Goldman Sachs, Boston Foundation. Now she's raising money for the base. From the hood, college graduate doing the work. Roshni Robbins, raise your hand. I met Roshni Robbins in graduate school. Boston wanted to kill me. I was leading a black and Latino boys initiative. I hired an Indian young woman to lead the initiative. Do we have the guts of change? Why did I have to hire an African-American man um, or Latino man to do this. So I share this because what the base is is about changing the mindset. It's changing the narrative. If we keep calling our young folks at risk, underserved, disadvantaged, then guess what, folks? Boo on us. When we actually look at something, if you look at the word urban and you look to define urban, it's always with a deficit. So what the base is about urban talent. It's about getting young folks to actually believe in themselves that you have access to college and a career. And so much that I took from the panel. We were crazy enough. We decided, guess what? We want our young folks. When I started the base four and a half years ago, I said, I'm going to raise $100 million in scholarships. People said, I don't know. I'm going to ask. So, folks, I knocked on doors. I went and met college presidents, talked to them. Here's the funny thing. They all have to come to the base. You've got to come to the hood because it's a privilege to get my young people. See, it's a privilege to get a young black and Latino male. And two years ago, we started females from none to 200. It's a privilege to get them. So in three and a half years, 
We have $35 million in scholarships. We followed posse. We sent 194 kids to college. I get 80 kids in college, room, board, and tuition for nothing. Folks, and that's not made up. That's real. See, because colleges don't know how to recruit black and brown. And colleges don't know how to do cultural competency. So what you do is if you get a president like Francesco Cesare at Assumption College that is willing to stand up and shift and change, magic happens. And you know where it started? Because all of our kids actually eat Spanish food. They went to college and they never knew there was this thing called American food. No, but it's real. Francesco Cesare decided once a week he'll do Spanish food and he actually partnered with our 15 students that are on full scholarships at Assumption College and they actually do Spanish food and Spanish meals once a week. The College of St. Joseph's, the second whitest city in America. I have 22 kids on scholarships at the College of St. Joseph's. We don't accept one athletic scholarship, all academic scholarships. I got young brothers in Rutland. Now remember, during school break, when our young brothers come home, the whole demographics of Vermont changes. <laughs> but it's real. But it's real. But St. Joseph says, if we're going to be part of changing the economy in Vermont, we need young brothers from the city to come. It's not coincidental either that St. Joseph's won the NCAA Division III National Championship a couple years in a row. NCJA, excuse me. NCJA a couple years in a row. And all of a sudden, we have 10 kids on their baseball team. You walk in a base, you will not see a picture of any of my professional players. We have 11. You will not see one. When you look and you cheer my professional players, they're back at the base because they never left. Our college players don't leave and come back. They've never left. They're from the projects in the neighborhood. I guess what I'm saying is that we have to disrupt a system that is failing our kids. We got to disrupt a system that's failing our kids. We have to be willing to invest in leaders. And I'm going to say this to have the courage to stand because it takes courage. Folks, 70% of nonprofits serving kids in Boston are closed at six o'clock. We know this. We fund this. How is this possible? Did you know only 6% of black and Latino boys in Boston get physicals? Did you know that? I'm asking. But we have the greatest hospitals in the world. For who? So guess what? At your college fairs, bring pediatricians. At your open house, come to a base game. David Harris, good friend of mine, will tell you. You come to a base baseball game in Roxbury. We have colleges actually doing college applications. We do financial aid on the field. We actually bring nutritionists on the field, and we bring the vegetable and the fruit truck. Remember back in the day we were young? The parks were the places we all went. We, what we have to do is reactivate that. I'm not saying we're doing anything special. I'm doing everything when I meet with my friends at 501 and we talk about if we can, we will. It's a fascinating one between nine and five we work. And at 501, when you get your friends and folks together, we have the greatest ideas in the world. I said, so use 501 as the vehicle to work. And at the end of the day, folks, what we're gonna do is we have to move a needle. We have no other choice except to move a needle. We have no other choice to let every young person know you have access and the opportunity to go to college. Um, we're blessed, and I can't wait. You know, we had our first cohort of 8 out of 10 kids graduated college. My board was telling me how good it was, and I was, like, naive. I was pissed at what happened to the other two <laughs> because that's real, right? These are the brothers going back in the neighborhood. So those are the things that we're, we're pushing. And the last thing I would say is challenge corporate America to stand up. 98% of the money I've raised is because they come to the base. I have not gone to a corporate meeting downtown in five years. I refuse. I refuse. And you might say, Robert, you're kidding. And my colleagues here will tell you, if I sit in a corporate meeting, they come to the base, I don't like what they say, what do I do? I walk out. I don't take money. You can't buy me. I'm on a moral standard, folks. And I am unapologetic that I love young black and brown boys and girls. I am unapologetic. And I went from giving away 20 million bucks at the Boss Foundation, taking off a suit, to wear jeans, and I apologize if my jeans offense anyone. Some people say, Robert, it's a social thing, you gotta be dressed up. Ah, my suit doesn't determine my success, I do. So I guess what I'd say at the end, it's so cool to be here, it's so cool to be with disruptors. I am privileged that the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute is doing our evaluation. It's a privilege. Um, last thing I'd say to folks, I just want to say on 
We talk about economic development in communities. We have our big event coming up on Thursday. If you want to come, let us know. In four years, we're doing well. But why is it we talk about economic sustainability, and when we do our biggest events, we do them in downtown restaurants? I don't get it. So ours is the Reggie Lewis Track and Field Center, right in Roxbury. We do it every year. Our vendors are all from the neighborhood. We actually put the money back into their pockets. Oh, and I'm four years old. How many folks have gone to big events? You've seen big events? Come to our event. No VIP. All of our kids run a practice an hour before the event starts. And if anyone wants to know, a black leader from Roxbury with 13 staff, Thursday night we will raise $1.1 million at my event. A black leader from Roxbury with 13 staff will raise over a million. You know why? Not because of anything we've done. It's because we disrupted and we built an army of leaders like yourself that says our kids matter. So it's a privilege to be here. If I offend anyone with my words, I'm unapologetic. But folks, we have a moral, obliga moral obligation. Our kids are waiting for us and need us now more than any time in the history of this country. Let's all stand for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. You didn't offend us. In, uh, you, you fired us up. You all fired us up. Uh, and uh, we're going to take right now questions from the audience. I had my own questions, but I think it's more important for the audience to get involved. Um, before I turn the floor over to you, I want to say a couple of things. Um, one, if there's anyone in the room who wants to help out the Institute as we launch our own initiatives, please send me an email. Um, my uh, email address is on the Harvard Law School website. We'd be happy to um, work with you. And the other thing I want to say is um, I am going to actually be departing my own event um, in about five minutes because I have something else to do. Um, we have uh, Professor Flowers, who's going to close out for us, and um, uh, David Harris, who's the managing director of the Institute. Um, you'll be in good hands. And now... Um, we'll bring Deborah back up to the stage and take some questions from the audience. You must have questions. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Sharon. I'm from the community. I was a Quester Scholar um, at Sebastian um, for the last four years. I graduated law school um, in Rhode Island. Um, and I guess, don't talk yet. <laughs> um, I guess my question is I think a lot of times. People want to call us um, disadvantaged without call it, realizing that we come from, we were colonized, like we were robbed, and things were taken from us, from our communities. And um, throughout my education, I, I wanted to know how come nobody took the time to harness the knowledge that we did have. Everybody always came to us wanting to like deputize us or make us sort of like a, a face for something. But nobody came and said, hey, what are some of the knowledge that you've learned from the, the, I guess I'm gonna call it, what is it, the term, uh, the, the, the intellectuals who don't have the degree, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is, like, no one cared about that type of knowledge, and it made the college experience really rough. Um, so I guess my question is, is, like, how come, you know, like, how come people just treat us as these, like, blank slates that they want to direct, instead of, like, harnessing what we do come with already? Thank you. That's a great um, question. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a great question, but it's real, right? Um, it's, it's a very interesting. We call our kids student athletes. We call them great in urban talent. And it's interesting um, because so much of data and statistics are all saying what our kids aren't and what they are. We surround our young folks with, I love to say, the best intellect. And it's from the Mel Kings of the world. Um, you know, the first person we honored was... Charles Ogletree, everyone thought it was from Harvard. It was no. It was because who Charles Ogletree is, right? And like, and do people know his story and the values and the upbringing, the struggle? And, 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 and it's partly why, if you look at our staff, you know, in, uh, for instance, all of our staff are college grads, but all of our staff are from the neighborhood. All of our staff, like, you know, you know brothers been murdered, all the stories that they tell about folks, but their zip code didn't determine that. Um, I start to think about this is because we don't sit down and get a chance to know each other. We talk at each other, but we don't talk to each other. The other thing, too, which is tough at times, is that, 
you have to define yourself because you're an institution at Harvard, not how smart you are, but were you a quota? Those up, like when you get like a promotion, did you get it because it was a diversity hire versus a talent hire? Um, I guess I would say to you is, you know, use the power of your language, use the power of your own narrative. And I'm also saying don't let others define who you are and tell your story. You know, use this opportunity to tell your own. And I think the more we create environments for our young leaders and exceptional young leaders like you to have a voice and to speak your mind, that's fine. People are going to define you by what they see and say sometimes, but only you will be your voice um, of action. So that's just a thought, and I would bet there's, there's others on top of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we oh. all struggle with. Push, I'm sorry, oh, we I'm push sorry. at the same time. I think it's, oh. I think it's something that um, organizations struggle with, and I think you almost alluded to this a little bit earlier, that sometimes people only want to fund the at-risk child, right? You try to get the most pitiful story to place on your website, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's the way a lot of nonprofits run, and that's the way, that's the type of, um, that's the way that they get money. And I'm, and I'm just going to be honest with you. And we've tried very hard, at least at, at our organization, not to do that. Um, but what we also try to do is nuance our students. So I don't want to rob you of anything. What I want you to do is be able to move into any space and feel comfortable there. That's all I, that's, that was our goal. Um, and I think um, having the opportunity, and we spent four years with our students, having the opportunity to have those tough conversations. I have sat down with students where um, just a few months ago, a student was in my office before I left the organization telling me about how the N-word was used in her high school class. And the teacher said nothing. She is the only black student in that class. And the teacher said nothing. And when she raised, when she raised the concern, you know, there was kind of like, oh, what happened? What happened? No student should have to be in that situation where they have to defend themselves in a classroom where there's a teacher present, right? And so we have to sit down and process those things. And unfortunately, that is the reality that our young people find themselves as we all find ourselves in. And all we can hope for is that we equip you with the skills to navigate those situations and to be able to do it in a way that maintains your dignity, but also teaches a lesson at the same time. And then, and then the rest of us come behind and send letters and make phone calls. Because exactly. I, I can, I can just, do that. I, I, I really agree with you. I, we have, as a nation, decided that there's something wrong with young people in America and that we need to fix that. And we forget that there's really nothing wrong with young people in America at all, nothing. It's we that we have to fix. It's our institutions that we have to fix. And we need to train ourselves and rework our institutions mm -hmm. so that they're welcoming for students from any background. And we have a huge problem. You know, this was in the Trump era, was the, the end of the title of this event. We are now living in a country where the administration has basically said to the public, it's okay to be racist, it's okay to be misogynistic, it's okay to hate, and you better watch your back if you're from fill in the blank category. Well, we need to understand whatever your political views are, and I guess you can hear what mine are, <laughs> but whatever your views are, we need to understand that kids are afraid mm -hmm. more now ever, more now than ever. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility as institutions and organizations and leaders to protect kids. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that is not to fix them. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with them. You say, it's the first time I've heard this, Rob, that we say the same thing. Posse is not for poor, disadvantaged, minority, underprivileged, underserved, whatever the fill-in-the-blank deficit is. If we create deficit-based programs, right. students yeah. will see mm -hmm. themselves that way or understand that we see them that way. <laughs> There's a problem with them. So what is a strength-based program? How do you develop it? And how do you go into the universities mm -hmm. to retrain like faculty? Right. We have seen that faculty are terrified. They're so scared of saying something. If we run workshops, we, we uh, have consulting and we run workshops all over the United States, we say to a room full of 50 faculty, 
How many of you feel comfortable dealing with a racist comment made in your classroom? Oh, there's all different levels. And then we say, how many of you ever experienced that? And almost 100% of faculty, no matter where we go, raise their hand. It happens mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what to do. They, know what to do. they have no idea. Mm -hmm. So I just want to support that mm -hmm. and say that's a shift. Yeah. Um, I know we want to get to other questions as well, but I, I think flipping the narrative is our responsibility um, in helping our students to feel validated because I'm looking at you and I I think you probably have one of the most amazing stories we all have amazing stories and to validate and help students articulate that and again prepare and empower them to enter any space and to create you know a network that will be supportive of, of their of their goals as well but flipping the narrative particularly in the world of development I think is something that is one of my own um, missions because I can't tell you how often I'm like no we're not going to use the term at risk no we're not going to use the term under resource or whatever how about high promise how about outstanding academically ready to go you know I'm just it's infuriating and I I think that's one of my own personal I would say too, we're responsible too, not just philanthropy, is to call out our friends and colleagues that run nonprofits that use that right, term too. Absolutely. Because philanthropy is not going to change if we don't unite as this collective group of leaders to say we will no longer accept that. Absolutely. And be real. When our students come in, we talk about how they're joining an elite group of leaders on our campus and that they have to grow up faster than any other first year students on this campus because guess what? Next year you're going to be interning all over this institution helping us meet our goals as an organization. So it's not about those predictive analytics. I think they're great, but I don't really care about them. Right? You're my student. You're here. You're a leader now. And we're going to train you, and we're going to learn from you, and you're going to learn from your colleagues and move forward. Sorry, get a little excited. I think we all get a little excited about what we do. This Other question, questions? This is a question for Robert. Oh. Um, what, what role or what's your message to white folks who don't have um, a uh, hood zip code or haven't uh, had certain shared experiences or background who are deeply concerned about inequities and social justice. I mean, in, in really concrete terms, what, 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 do you, what do you say to those folks? Damn, you put me out there. <laughs> first, first of all, uh, I'm going to say, because we're real, right? I'm almost tired of educating white folks, yeah, no, right? No, no, I get tired of educating white folks, and I'll share why. I know a lot of people, but you call me and ask me to help diversify your board. I know white people. No one's ever called me to recommend a white person for a board. A couple of things that I say is acknowledge the fair, acknowledge this, but you know what? I find folks know. So, and I don't say this to be funny. Here we are, we probably, you know, have won the Massachusetts baseball thing for 10 years in a row. Isn't it interesting that all of the suburban white fathers whose kids play baseball on Saturdays at Melnia Cass in Roxbury, they send all their kids in the train with us? They know it when it's for their own personal good. I think the thing that we have to break down is it's really we don't talk enough about race. We don't talk enough, and it's almost fearful for someone to feel they can ask. A good friend of mine asked a question, and it was like he was struggling. Robert, do I call you? African-American, or do I call you black? I says, if you don't know, then get to know my name. <laughs> Not to be funny, because people are caught up in discussions, and people are caught up, if I say something, will I offend, right? So we spend all of this time, and I guess my big thing is, I'm usually asked, and I'll go and speak at Wellesley High, and folks, I'm usually the only one at the bat mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, <laughs> I'm the only one at the party. I love the folks that says, look, you know, I go to Boston, look, Robert's here as my guest, and I look around, and yeah, I am. I guess my big thing is, how do we create dialogues? How do we create opportunity to talk? How do we, from across the board, get comfortable that it's okay for us to have these questions and, and have this? And I guess the only thing I would ask, and this is the thing for me, is don't be afraid to walk in the neighborhood as well. Here's the other thing, too, and I'm going to give everyone, white folks, I'm going to tell you something you didn't know. You're going to laugh, but I'm going to tell you the truth. 
Walk in Roxbury tonight at 7 o'clock. You're more safer than any young group of black men that walk in. Do you know why? If you walk in tonight at 7 o'clock, they think you're the jury or they think you're a cop. The only time you see a group of white folks in Roxbury at night is when they're the jury. I'm being honest. So this whole myth that I can't walk in neighborhoods, it's this whole thing. We read the Globe and the Herald and see the news too much. I just think we, we almost have no choice that we have, to, we have to start doing this. And it starts with us. We can't look outside the doors. We can't look at others. The other thing I would challenge you, have these discussions at your boardrooms. At our board, we talk about issues of race. It freaks them out, but you have to. But if you're not willing to have this discussion with your boardroom, you're not willing to have this discussion with your friends. And if you watch sports or movies at TV and you invite friends over, take a look at who's in the room. Because that's really a reflection on us. And I think we can do better. And I'd, I, I'd really say this. Maybe it takes a group of folks and us to sit together and invite friends to come on in. And it has to start somewhere. So thank you for did, that. Did you see that picture of Paul Ryan? <laughs> do you know what that picture is? What is it? The interns. His interns. I, I that's, a con- party. that's a conscious <laughs> decision, right? That's right. How hard is it to not hire one black intern? That's hard. Mm-hmm. You have to make an effort not to do that. It's, it's almost that simple. We just have to do it. If you're hiring someone, if you're recommending someone, look at, look at what you can do to change it. We don't believe, actually, I know I'm going to sound like a negative person. I don't actually think we can wait. Because all that data that I showed shows that there's something in place that's not allowing change to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? All the promises we made during the civil rights movement, we failed to deliver on those promises. We failed our kids. We have failed. So what do we do? We're going to wait till we fix K through 12, and we're going to, no. all of these initiatives are so important and so good, but we're thinking and you know strategically, let's put different people at the table where the decisions get made. Then the decisions may begin to look a little different. Thank you all. So uh, I just want to remind everybody that this is called the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for race and justice, and this is where we talk about these things. It's my honor also to introduce our colleague and uh, co-sponsor who shares the name, the Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, in a a remarkable uh, uh, organization that he runs at Clemson University. He's been with us. This is our third third biennial uh, conference, and we're really fortunate to have Mr. Lamont, Dr. Lamont Flowers wrap us up. Uh, Lamont. Good afternoon, and uh, what a wonderful event uh, this has been. Um, We'd like to thank uh, Professor Brown Nagin and Dr. David Harris for supporting this fantastic endeavor, and all of you for joining us today as we reflect on the impact of Charles Hamilton Houston, a man who graduated from Harvard Law School after serving his country in World War I. As a law student, he served as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. Then pursuant to graduating, he went to Howard University, an historically black college, and served as a dean and a faculty member. It was there where he organized a team of law students, lawyers, and social scientists to argue cases which obviously eventually led to one of the most amazing cases in education, Brown versus Board, where the Supreme Court noted that separate but equal was inherently unequal. Later, they would note that states would have to move with all deliberate speed to pursue the law of the land with regard to access and equity. (laughs) This is the enduring legacy of Charles Hamilton Houston. Again, my name is Lamont Flowers. I do have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Charles H. Houston Center for the study of the black experience in education at Clemson University. I also serve as a a state commissioner on the State Commission for Higher Education, uh, sorry, for Minority Affairs uh, in South Carolina. That's an organization that um, oversees the state agency that looks at issues related to uh, minorities in uh, South Carolina. So, of course, I'm honored to be here today to uh, have the opportunity to sort of 
add some parting words uh, to this symposium. The enduring legacy of Charles Hammond Houston. Of course, his legacy is greater than education, as we all know. Um, he was fighting for justice many years, well before 1954, actually. In, for example, in 1935, he questioned the constitutionality of uh, jury selection in cases involving African Americans. Hmm. Very important. In 1938, he challenged racial discrimination in um, the University of Missouri School of Law, Lloyd Gaines. 1944, he fought for American, African American firefighters who were just looking for a seat at the table, if you will, in the collective bargaining agreement. Finally, in 1948, he fought for African American families who bought land um, with, in places that had restrictive covenants that uh, said that African Americans could not buy property in certain places. As you think about these awesome freedoms, though, that we have today in our great country, and there's no question about that, you consider that the liberties and, and all these equal protections that we have, that we have them because of someone's sacrifice, whether it's the men and women of the armed forces, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's other first responders, or historical figures like Charles Hamilton Houston, who fought and challenged the status quo. So fast forwarding to today, as we consider all we've seen and all we've heard, I think a suitable and appropriate question emerges. And that question is, what will someone say about our legacy? What better place to ask that question than Harvard University, one of the world's leading institutions? And you see, that's really why we're here today. The entire convening, actually, has been to pursue one purpose, one perspective, and one very relevant follow-up question. What do we do next? I can tell you that after this invigorating and motivational experience, I'm going to go back to South Carolina and continue to analyze data, explore relationships between and among factors that uh, impact success for underrepresented students, educators, and administrators. I'm going to also continue to conduct and examine and evaluate interventions that may also do the same to promote and enhance educational and occupational attainment. Those are the keys. So what are we going to do next? Are we going to support the work of a panelist member who combined athletics and education to enhance educational outcomes? <laughs> are we going to support the work of a panelist member who uses legal and other education-centered perspectives and activities to enhance opportunities for future lawyers? Maybe we're going to support the work of a keynote speaker who talked about a wonderful program and listed and highlighted the challenges affecting all of us. Lastly, you might consider a career in identifying solutions, analyzing data, discussing research and scholarship for all students. I can almost feel the ideas percolating in your mind. I look forward to hearing about more of the great work that we all will do as we confront all of these situations. But I do believe it's this strategic and diligent and action-oriented mindset that we all need. And I think the point of this event also is that it sort of serves as a reminder that more work is needed, but also provides us with a rubric and even a checklist, actually, <laughs> of activities that we can pursue to make a difference for this generation and the next. On behalf of the wonderful speakers and the panelists, I would like to thank you for being a part of this symposium. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I also want to thank you all, and I, I, I feel obligated to give a shout to a couple of people who really made this happen. Uh, where is Damie? Is Damie still here? See, and Kelly Garvin, who did not escape today. Uh, she, she, she's much more than a timekeeper and really is responsible for helping to make all this happen. Again, we thank you all for coming. I want to let you know that on uh, 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 the 28th, we'll be screening a film called Do Not Resist. I encourage you, if you're not on our uh, mailing list, to go to our website, uh, charleshamiltonhouston.org. Get on it and stay abreast of what we're doing. I think there will be events that follow up on this uh, in the future. And again, one more round of applause for our guests. Thank you.
great to meet you.